it or not, as many of us are still analyzing whether Baba had an impact on Central Province, Mount Kenya region or not, there are others who are talking about a Baba wave in the Mount Kenya region. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. At your wave, are they serious? What is really going on? On today's show, I'm going to attempt to break down exactly what is happening on the ground in the Mount Kenya region and why. And then we will conclude yeah, and discover whether what these people are saying is just porojo or there's some truth in it. Karibu sana. My name, in case you're new to this channel, is Chris Kumekucha. So, let's start by asking some hard questions. Now, we know that when Raila toured the Mount Kenya region recently, he spent most of his time meeting and talking to watu wakubwa, watu wazito. He was not on the ground with ordinary folk. And indeed the DP Ruto camp has taken full advantage of this. And they're going around telling people, telling Kenyans, that the dynasties were looking for votes in boardrooms. But DP Ruto is going to look for votes on the grassroots. Yeah. Anyway, so our first question is what wave are they talking about? Now, let us be honest. Since the deputy president started his campaigns, shortly after the 2017 presidential polls, and people have started claiming that he's popular, yeah, the yardstick of popularity has mainly been based on politicians, bigwigs, influential people in a certain region, rather than actual votes from the ground, rather than support from the people on the ground. Yes, we have had a few by-elections here and there, but the deputy president has lost some. Yeah, won others. Bottom line, the truth is that the deputy president's popularity so far has mainly been measured using influencers that is, members of parliament and bigwigs, influential politicians in certain regions. In other words, the deputy president started his presidential campaign by going for opinion leaders, politicians, influential people in the regions where he's looking for votes, yeah, which is exactly what Rayla did recently in the Mount Kenya region. And just to confirm, I'm told the wave that is being talked about involves mainly politicians. Yeah. And the tickets, political parties, they're going to vine in the upcoming general elections. And it would seem that right now the feeling on the ground is that many will use parties that are sympathetic to Ray Laudinga and his presidential bid, rather than any vehicles belonging to the deputy president. That is what I'm being told. In other words, according to these claims, yeah, we have defections loading, defections from UDA to Ray Laudinga's camp. Aye. <laughs> now, of course, as a serious analyst, you don't have to believe everything you hear. You don't have to believe every information you receive, even if it is from previously reliable sources. You're not supposed to be under any circumstances. Gullible. Eh? No. 
you are supposed to carefully break down, yeah, analyze and confirm for yourself whether what you are being told is true or not. Now, the first thing we must acknowledge is that if you go into a region, any region in Kenya, and you receive massive collective support from the bigwigs in that region, that is not inconsequential. No, it is not irrelevant. Hey, how now? Now I need to clarify something before we even proceed any further. Yeah, because I know somebody will shoot back and say, the Mount Kenya billionaires have not yet made their final decision. They want to meet other presidential candidates. <laughs> Kweli. Okay, I know many of you will say, Chris, whatever you say, it is not official. Okay, that is true. But let us put ourselves in the shoes of these billionaires for a few seconds. Would you waste your time, yeah, because you're a very busy person, or would you pick yeah, the most likely persons to win the election? You tell me. If I were them, I would only interview two candidates, yeah, if they're interested. Deputy President William Samoy Ruto and Raila Odinga. Period. That is the brutal reality of politics. If a dark horse candidate emerges, there's no problem. A dark horse candidate is an outsider, an unlikely winner. Yeah, of course, which is very possible in the elections we're facing in 2022. Anyway, if such a candidate emerges and it looks like they have a chance of winning, they can always interview that particular person, talk to them closer to the elections. There's no problem. But they need to start covering their bases early. So back to what we're saying. When you're talking to these what was it was zito, these are employers. These are people capable of raising finances for campaigns. Some of the people we are talking about employ tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of potential voters countrywide. They can do things like organize and make it easy for those in their employment to get voter cards, yeah, to register to vote early etc etc all these numerous small things don't add up to nothing do they and then there's something else yeah much more important since independence the house of mumbi the mount kenya region has tended to vote like a block no politician so far has managed to divide them so that they vote differently. The rich people vote differently. The poor people vote differently. Yeah. Or rather the have-nots vote one way. And then the haves vote in another direction. That has never happened. And therefore it is unlikely yeah, that it will happen in 2022. And there is a very good reason for that. And that reason is very deep. In the house of Mumbi DNA. You see as I've said in other videos on this channel. This is a community that has had to survive. Against great odds. Yeah. Right from the colonial days. When they were hunted. Yeah. Discriminated against. By the colonial government. Yeah. Because the colonial government felt. That this community. Did not support them. Yeah. And the reasons were obvious. A lot of the land taken away from locals was taken away from this community. Most of the grabbing 
by white settlers affected the Kikuyu community. Many of them found themselves with nothing. Yeah, land gone, relocated to a camp somewhere. Their lives were turned upside down and therefore they had to survive. And there was no way they were going to survive unless they stuck together. Bottom line, it is in their DNA. Let me just give you one very good example to illustrate what I'm saying. In 2002, we had a very interesting situation where the two leading presidential candidates were both from the House of Mumbi. Uhuru Kenyatta for Kanu and of course Mwai Kibaki for NAC, National Rainbow Coalition. And the Uhuru Kenyatta campaign team, yeah, like any political campaign would do, tried their best to use the traditional rivalry between Kikuyus from Kiambu yeah, and those from Nyeri. It has always been felt yeah, that the ones from Nyeri are the ones who suffered most fighting for independence. Indeed, this is the region that was the headquarters of the Mau Mau freedom fighters. Yeah, and on the other hand, Kiambu Kikuyus tended to collaborate, sympathize with the colonialists. Many of them were home guards working for the Mzungu. Yeah, and therefore, one of the strategies of the Uhuru Kenyatta camp at that time was to ensure that all the votes from Kiambu, Moranga, all the votes from outside Nyeri would go to Uhuru Kenyatta, which would have divided the region yeah, and given Uhuru Kenyatta the majority of the votes from the area. It never happened. To the utter amazement of the Daniel Toretich Arab Moy think tank at that time, and I've mentioned I personally knew some of the members of that think tank, to their utter amazement, the community rallied at the last minute and their votes all went in one direction. Nyeri and Mwaikibaki. And of course Mwaikibaki won those elections. What I'm saying is that it is not easy to divide the Kikui vote. Maybe not impossible, but very difficult. But the most important take home here is that that shift, that decision, began, wait for this one, with the bigwigs in the community. Yeah, then it spread everywhere. That means down, yeah, to those who are not very fortunate, and virtually to everybody, the community. And of course, the major driving force with the bigwigs is that they were just fed up with Daniel Toretich and Apmoy. He had destroyed their businesses. Yeah, They found it very difficult to do business, to operate. In those days, yeah, Moy had done real damage to their finances. Now, with all this information, if you still believe that the big wigs of Central Province making a decision means nothing, <laughs> Shoriako, yeah, it is your democratic right to believe what you want to believe. Yeah, but I'm giving you the facts. Now, also based on all that information. I think you're now beginning to see what these people making wild claims of a wave may be talking about. <laughs> I think you're now beginning to see. And so maybe it is true that there's a Baba wave building up in the Mount Kenya region. However, this is politics. Anything can happen. Things change very quickly. Yeah, so the best thing we can do is to wait and see what happens. Yeah, give it a few weeks, give it a few months, and we keep monitoring the trend on the ground, yeah, and we see what direction things are going. There is really no big hurry to make a conclusion. Yeah, 
twende mosmos and we shall find out the truth sooner rather than later until next time this is chris kumekuche